Okay, so we will start now. Um, welcome to MedExam Experts free webinar. Um, today, our topic will be pruritus in pregnancy. And I, am, I, I will be your mentor, Dr. Desiree Gonzalez. I am a mentor for physician licensure exam in the Philippines and also the mentor of MRCOG1. I will be handling uh, microbiology and biostatistics for MedExam expert. Okay, so let's start now. Uh, most of the source of this um, webinar is uh, taken from the TOG article, uh, Skin Eruptions Specific to Pregnancy. A little bit of pieces coming from Green Top Guideline 43 for obstetric cholestasis and intrahepatic cholestasis, TOG article published in 2016. Um, before we go to the pruritus in pregnancy, of course, we should first know the physiological changes in pregnancy, right? So there's a table in this article where in, in the box one, it is tabulated the normal physiologic skin changes in pregnancy. Okay, here, we will go to it but one by one. So the normal skin changes in pregnancy includes uh, increase in skin pigmentation. The increase in skin pigmentation is due to increase in estrogen, progesterone, and melanocyte stimulating hormone levels. It is more noticeable in dark skin individuals and usually fades after delivery, but often doesn't disappear completely. You will also notice darkening of your nipples and external genitalia, especially in the pubic area. There is the appearance of secondary areola, which is a pigmented area around the primary areola, appearing during the fifth month of pregnancy. You will also notice Montgomery tubercles or follicles, which are non-pigmented hypertrophic sebaceous glands elevation in the primary areola. You will also notice darkening of your existing moles. Your skin tags will increase in number. And of course, you all know what linea nigra is. It is a dark line on the abdomen running straight down from the umbilicus. Another skin changes in pregnancy is your melasma. It usually occurs in 75% of pregnant women and predominantly appear in the second or third trimester. Just give me a minute. Okay, sorry for the interruption. It usually occurs in the second or the third trimester. It is brown, clearly defined patches on the face. It usually appears in the forehead, malar distribution, and cheekbones. Often persists for months and years postpartum. Uh, the treatment can prove challenging, and all of the recommended treatment are contraindicated in pregnancy. So the best way to avoid melasma is avoid excessive sunlight exposure and the use of your sunscreens. So this um, illustration shows the distribution of your melasma, forehead and malar distribution, and the cheekbones. We are familiar with stria gravidarum, right? These are linear red purplish stretch marks that occurs in the abdomen, breast, thighs, lower backs, buttocks, and upper arms, or the areas that are widely stretched. It is resulting from the stretching of the skin and usually occurs in the second trimester. Uh, what causes stria gravidarum is the rupture of your dermal elastic fibers. This is why it is not reversible, okay? That means when your dermal elastic fibers ruptured, it can never grow back. That's why your stria gravidarum will only lighten, but it will never disappear. So they often fade in the postnatal period to te teen atrophic hypopigmented scars. What are the risk factors for your stria? First, personal or family history, dark-skinned women, excessive abdominal distension in pregnancy. The use of emollients are helpful, but there is no evidence that vitamin E, tea tree oil, or what you usually hear, cocoa butter, have no special value. Another skin changes that is normal in pregnancy is your spider nevi. 
It occurs due to increased estrogen that causes dilatation, congestion, and proliferation of your blood vessels that can be seen on or through the skin. Uh, on the contrary, if your stria gravidarum occurs in dark-skinned women, your spider nevi occurs in Caucasian or fair-skinned individuals. Usually, it occurs in 60% of Caucasian women compared with 11% in black people. <coughs> The usual sites includes the eyes, like in the diagram, you can see it was in the, in the cheekbone, the neck, the face, the upper chest, the hands, and the arms. It usually appear in the second trimester and disappear within three months after delivery. If treatment is required, especially those in the lower extremities, um, sclerotherapy and laser therapy can be used. Aside from the skin changes, we have other changes during pregnancy, uh, which includes the gland and other uh, ectodermal structures, okay? For your gland activity, you have increased secretion of your eccrine. These are your eccrine glands and your apocrine glands, okay? So when the secretion of your eccrine glands increases towards the third trimester, it can cause prickly heat or malaria and hyperhidrosis, which can contribute to pruritus. Other skin changes in pregnancy are noted not only in the skin, but also other ectodermal structures, as I mentioned, which, which are your hair and your nails. During pregnancy, you have increased hair growth antenatally, and this is thought to be due to the prolongation of your anagen phase. Look at this diagram below. This is the hair cycle. So our hair cycle has three cycles, your anagen phase, three phases, anagen phase, catagen phase, and telogen phase. After the telogen phase, the cycle starts over. During the telogen phase, the end, um, end phase of that cycle, uh, the hair falls off and it grows back again. So during pregnancy, your anagen phase is prolonged. We have a condition in pregnancy wherein there is an excessive hair fall that happens during the last trimester and especially in the postpartum. Do you remember what condition is that? If you guess acute telogen effluvium, then you are right. Acute telogen effluvium is a generalized hair shedding with diffuse non-scarring alopecia characteristically occurs in three to six months postpartum. Generally, Recovery is spontaneous and occurs within nine to 12 months and rarely does hair density fail to recover completely. On the diagram you will see here, uh, alopecia. Okay, this is your acute telogen effluvium. For the changes in your nails, your nails tend to grow faster during pregnancy and can become dystrophic, brittle, and soft and or pigmented. Mucosal changes also include pigmentation, hyperemia, and hypertrophy, which can lead to bleeding. So this is why our basic knowledge of the physiological changes in pregnancy is very important because this will guide you to know the abnormal changes in pregnancy, okay, in the clinical part, okay? So there is a condition in pregnancy wherein your gums becomes inflamed and easily bleeds whenever you do, when, whenever you brush your teeth. And the condition is what we call epulis of pregnancy or pregnancy epulis, okay? So now after, after reviewing, after, the, after we finish reviewing the normal uh, physiologic changes in pregnancy, now we go to our topic, pruritus in pregnancy. Okay, so when you say pruritus, also known, known as prurigo, or itchiness in pregnancy. Pruritus is, uh, pruritus in the absence of any underlying disorder is a common complaint affecting 18% of pregnancy. So pruritus is common among pregnant women. And usually the common sites include the scalp and the abdomen. It can start as early as the third month and peaks a month before delivery. But you have to exclude, before you go to the dermatosis of pregnancy, you have to exclude other causes of itchiness in pregnancy because there are sometimes, sometimes there are um, itchiness that is not pathologic. Okay, like, like for this example, we have dermog dermographism or dermatographism or 
Dermatographia artefacta. Okay, so dermographism and urticaria are common in the last half of pregnancy. It is when you, when you scratch your skin, it leaves a mark, elevated mark, like in this diagram. Do you remember when we were studying back in med school, when tablets, laptop, and cell phones are not yet available, and we use the hard copy of the books because we don't have ebooks during that time? We use the dermatograph. If you remember the dermatograph, it is a highlighter like a pencil that you don't have to, like this one. That you don't have to sharpen. It's a colored pencil that you peel off so that you mark all, all the facts that you study. We call this dermatograph, okay? So that you remember, okay? So this is a dermatograph. But it is important to exclude other causes of pruritus, like scabies, contact dermatitis, drug-induced pruritus, and atopic dermatitis before you diagnose dermatographism urticaria or dermatographia artifacta. Okay, so what will make a physician suspect that this is dermatographism? Like I've said, the presence of skin excoriation, like in the diagram, and a glossy nails. Okay, why? Why would the nails become glossy? Because by scratching, you know, when you rub your nails, it becomes glossy. Okay, so you should suspect without, after ruling out any other causes. Okay. So now we go to the specific uh, TOG article that discusses the skin eruption that is specific to pregnancy. Okay. The TOG article um, published in 2013 only um, determined four dermatoses in pregnancy. These are your atopic eruption of pregnancy, pemphigoid gestationis, polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, and intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, which is sometimes called ICP or IHP. So these four dermatoses are specific to pregnancy. That means it doesn't occur if, if the patient is not pregnant. There's a nice table in that article wherein it differentiates the four dermatoses according to the areas affected, the risk factors, the recurrence risk, management, and pregnancy outcome. So focus your attention here. Polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, okay. Um, the areas affected, abdominal striae with peri-umbilical sparing. You have to remember this because this is um, the key word. If you have an exam scenario and says that the rashes appears in the abdominal striae and with peri-umbilical sparing, so automatically you should think of polymorphic eruption of pregnancy. On the contrary, your femphigoid gestation is appears around the umbilicus. So if your PEP or your polymorphic eruption spares the umbilicus, your pemphigoid gestation is, is starts with the umbilicus. Okay, I will just uh, point out some important facts and then later on we will discuss these four dermatoses one by one, okay? Pemphigoid gestation is, has recognized correlation with haplotypes, HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4. The only effective treatment for intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is your urso deoxycholic acid. And your pemphigoid gestation is, is associated with intrauterine growth restriction. And your ICP is um, related to increased risk of premature birth, meconium passage, and increased risk of cesarean section. So this is important to note. Remember, when you see an article and you see, don't skip the tables because sometimes the table summarizes everything that is important for you to know, okay? So let's go to intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Actually, um, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy or previously known as obstetric cholestasis has been discussed extensively by our respected mentor, Dr. Mohamed Helmi. If you, have, uh, if you haven't, um, watch the webinar, I suggest, I strongly suggest that you watch his web, webinar. It is available in our webpage, okay, in our YouTube channel. I think in the MRCOG part one guide group, uh, we posted the link of that webinar together with this um, link for this webinar today, okay, because uh, here I will only tell you the 
um, summary of the intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy because Dr. Helmi al already discussed green top guideline number 43. Okay, so if you wanted, and I saw, uh, not wanted, I strongly suggest that you watch that webinar and you will learn a lot. Okay, so in summary, I will just mention the summary. The incidence of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is 0.7% in multi-ethnic populations in England. The risk factors are Indian Asian and Pakistani Asian origin and a history of previous intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Its prevalence is determined by genetic, hormonal, and environmental factors, and it varies between populations worldwide. The most common complaint of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, remember this, the pruritus is most severe at night and mainly affects the hands, feet, and pressure sites. So when you have an exam question that says itchiness in the palms and soles of the feet, automatically the examiner is guiding you to choose intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. And another tip, when you have itchiness without a rash, the first thing you should consider is your ICP, okay? Itchiness without a rash, okay? Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is caused by scratching and may occur in the back with sparing in the middle. Pruritus disturbs the sleeping pattern and severely affects the quality of life. Okay, one, uh, some of your complications are your preterm birth. This is not PTB or pulmonary tuberculosis. <laughs> this is preterm birth, meconium liquor, fetal distress, sudden IUFD, delivery by cesarean section is increased, and your postpartum hemorrhage. It is not possible to present, uh, at present to predict poor outcome from abnormal chemistry levels. Also remember this. There are no um, diagnostic tests like ultrasound, CTG, that will predict your fetal outcome. No evidence-based antenatal surveillance techniques are available for the prevention of your IUFD and your perinatal complications. Please note of this, pathognomonic of ICP, itchiness in the palms and soles of the feet without evidence of rash. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have all, you have to, um, exclude all the organic causes first of your itchiness before you go to intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. So as I've mentioned, itchiness without a rash, usually in the hands, feet, palms and soles, and the pressure sites. So that, that's, that's our, that, those are the keywords, okay? And of course, the elevated uh, liver enzymes. So we go to the investigations of ICP. You have to monitor your liver function and bile acid as it is crucial. It allows monitoring and exclusion, as I've said, of other condition. Viral screen, liver autoimmune, liver ultrasound, and PET screen to rule out other causes. Exclude it if liver function improves or worsen very rapidly. So that means while you are monitoring your liver function test and it becomes normal or improves, then you have to exclude obstetric cholestasis. How often do you monitor the liver function? So you monitor your liver function one to two weeks before you make the diagnosis. After you have established the diagnosis of obstetric cholestasis, then you have to monitor it weekly until delivery. Okay. Um, why do you have to monitor it before um, before you establish the diagnosis of obstetric cholestasis, because you have pruritus. So you have the onset of pruritus. Your liver function doesn't elevate immediately. Sometimes the patient uh, experiences long-standing pruritus become before the, abnormal, before the liver function test becomes abnormal. That's why you have to monitor it every one to two weeks. You don't have to rule it out immediately once you get a single liver function test. So when you monitor your pregnant women, and you, you have a normal liver function test, you cannot exclude it immediately. You have to repeat it one to two weeks and then see if it elevates. Okay, so once you establish the diagnosis, then you monitor it weekly until delivery. And when do you monitor postpartum? You have to wait until after 10 days as biochemistry may worsen in the immediate postnatal period. 
So remember, the recurrence risk is 45 to 90 percent. So you have to, to note of, uh, of this. When to do your LFTs after delivery? It's after 10 days, okay? So the treatment for your intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is your urso deoxycholic acid, the only known effective treatment of ICP. Your urso deoxycholic acid decreases maternal pruritus and improves liver function and prognosis for the fetus, but it doesn't prevent your fetal compromise, okay? The dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram per day as a single dose or in two divided doses. You have to remember that also the oxycholic acid or your um, UDCA is not licensed for use in obstetrical stasis. It is licensed in the UK for the treatment of your gallstones and biliary cirrhosis. So whenever you have to use a medicine that is unlicensed for, use, for its use, you have to ask for patient consent here at the, at the last paragraph. The patient's consent for unlicensed treatment needs to be obtained. It is not forbidden to use it, but you have to obtain a patient consent and you have to tell your patients that this medicine is licensed for another disease, but it will help relieve your pruritus and it will help improve your liver functions. Okay. So once, for example, you already started your pregnant women with urso deoxycholic acid and the, the pruritus or the symptoms doesn't improve, what is your second line of treatment? This was not mentioned in TOG article 2013, and this was not mentioned in GTD, GTG number 43, but it was mentioned in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy in 2016. Okay, the second line of treatment is your rifampicin, which is a chloretic antibiotic that has been shown to reduce pruritus and enhance bile acid secretion in primary biliary cirrhosis when used in conjunction with UDCA. Okay, so other symptomatic treatments will be your topical emollients. It will help you relieve, relieve your pruritus, your sedating antihistamines so that the pregnant women can sleep soundly at night, your water-soluble vitamin K, so to prevent clotting abnormalities due to hepatic effects of obstetric cholestasis. As we all know, why do we have to give um, water-soluble vitamin K in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy as a review? Okay, because your, um, because your bile acid tends, tends to deposit in your whole body, okay, it becomes unconjugated, so it deposits in the dermis. So it affects the what? It affects the absorption of your bile acids. That means when it is not conjugated, um, we have a difficulty in absorbing fat soluble vitamins like vitamin K. And when you have vitamin K deficiency, what happens? You have your clotting abnormalities. Okay, so that's why we give vit vitamin K, water soluble vitamin K, to patient, okay, uh, once a day. There is a small theoretical risk of neonatal hemolytic anemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and carnicterus. And the, uh, I mentioned this already. Okay, so if you want, again, let me repeat, if you want more detailed um, discussion on intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, I strongly suggest that you go to Dr. Helmi's webinar, which is posted in our YouTube channel. Now we go to the other dermatosis that, uh, that was mentioned in the ARTOG article in 2013. You have your atopic eruption of pregnancy, your polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, and your pemphigoid gestationist. Let me first drink a little bit of water. Okay, so you can see in the first picture, your atopic eruption of pregnancy involves the whole body. Remember, atopic eruption of pregnancy is your most common dermatosis of pregnancy. Don't, uh, don't, memorize, uh, don't look at the <laughs> percentages because I, I think this uh, diagram here is not updated, okay? So for the incidence of atopic eruption of pregnancy, it is one in 300 and your polymorphic eruption is one to 160 and one is to 300. So if you will notice, if you are very strict on the incidences, you will say why uh, the incidence of atopic eruption is high, is higher than, is lower than the polymorphic eruption in pregnancy, and yet it is the most common dermatosis of pregnancy. So 
I, I told you there are differences in incidences, but as of now, as of that article was published, and until now, atopic eruption of pregnancy is still the most common dermatosis of pregnancy. The other name of atopic eruption of pregnancy is your prurigo of pregnancy, prurigo gestationis, early onset prurigo of pregnancy. These are old terms, eczema of pregnancy and prolytic folliculitis of pregnancy. On the other hand, the other name for your PEP is your PUPP. If you remember, it was previously called as your pruritic ortical, orticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy, toxic erythema of pregnancy, late onset prurigo of pregnancy, linear IgM dermatosis of pregnancy. And your femfigoid gestation is, is, this is the incidence, okay? It's an autoimmune disease that is also called herpes gestationis, but it is not related to HSV. Okay, so the rash type distribution, um, your PEP, your polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, is pairs the umbilicus, as you can see in the diagram. Okay, it is around the umbilicus, but the umbilicus is not affected. While your femphigoid starts within the umbilicus and it has blisters. Okay. So please note of this, okay? So the timing of onset, usually the atopic eruption of pregnancy occurs in the first trimester. Your polymorphic eruption and your femphigoid gestation is occurs in your third trimester. Your atopic eruption of pregnancy is um, commonly associated with multiparous pregnancy, while your polymorphic eruption are common in nulliparous pregnancy. And whenever you encounter a question wherein asking you which dermatosis in pregnancy is associated with autoimmune condition like Graves disease or IDDM, okay, immediately you choose pemphigoid gestationis, okay? As I mentioned in the previous slide, there is correlation with HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4 in pemphigoid gestationis. Atopic eruption of pregnancy has no serious risk and polymorphic eruption has no serious risk to the fetus. So the one that is our concern, if we are talking about fetal compromise, is your femphigoid gestationis and your obstetrical stasis. Okay, so the treatment is usually symptomatic for your atopic eruption and your polymorphic eruption of pregnancy. And if you have femphigoid gestationis, it is better to refer to your dermatologist. Okay, there should be um, a joint management between an obstetrician gynecologist and your dermatologist, okay? For your PEP, the recurrence is rare, and for your atopic, it may recur, and your femphigoid also recur. And your obstetric cholestasis, I told you, the recurrence rate is 45 to 90 percent, correct? Okay. Now, this is uh, a good to know slide, okay? This is not uh, discussed in the TOB article of 2013, uh, the common dermatosis in pregnancy. Why? Because MP herpetiformis or your pustular psoriasis of pregnancy is um, not only exclusive to pregnancy, okay? This is, it can happen even in non-pregnant women or even in male, in the male population. But I wanted you to know this because sometimes um, it also causes intense, um, that it doesn't cause intense itching like in obstetric cholestasis, but it is compared to obstetric cholestasis because of the difference. As I mentioned a while ago, your obstetric cholestasis is pruritus, pruritus without a rash, okay? If you remember, while your impetigo herpetiformis is a rash without pruritus. So it's different. And the rash type distribution, I mentioned a while ago, your obstetric cholestasis tends to affect your palms and soles of the feet. In your impetigo herpetiformis, it occurs in your intertriginous area, which is your inguinal area, the underarms, the folds of your elbows. And remember this, it spares the palms and soles of your feet. So it's totally opposite to the, your obstetric cholestasis. So it's a form of generalized pustular psoriasis. The rash type distribution is a pus filled blisters that begins in the groins, under arms, folds of the knees and the elbows, okay? Um, the rash, um, 
after a few days, the rash will become blistered. It will, it will blister and scab, and then the rash will dry up. And then new blisters will appear at the edges of the dried up rash. Okay, um, I, am, I, I saw some, some flashing of light here in my chat box. Uh, let's just give me a minute. I will just finish my presentation and I will go over your chats and answer all your questions. Okay, I think we only have a few more slides to go and then I will go over, it, over the chat box. Okay, the rash is always accompanied, accompanied by severe illness. Remember this. It is not accompanied by pruritus. That's why I put this good to know because my slides or my topic today is pruritus in pregnancy. But I think it's good for you to know that impetigo hepatiformis happens also in pregnancy with a, with a rash without pruritus. Okay, but this rash is always accompanied by severe illness like chills, fever, vomiting, diarrhea, joint pains, and lymphadenopathy. And it typically presents in the third trimester and disappears after delivery. The common complications are secondary infections and septicemia. The treatment is just like for your femtic registration is systemic corticosteroid antibiotics and antenatal surveillance. It may also recur in subsequent pregnancies. Okay. The treatments, also symptomatic emollients, can be used to freely suit the skin topical antipyritics, topical corticosteroids, sedating antihistamine like your chlorpheniramine, ultraviolet light may help alleviate the symptoms. It is recommended that you wear soft light clothes and stay in cool environment because if you have this kind of rash and then you go to, you wore um, tight clothing and thick clothing, the more you will, the more rashes will, you will have, okay? In severe cases, oral corticosteroid, prednisolone, can be given to the patient, and you should decrease it five milligrams every three days until you reach zero. Of course, you have to monitor your glucose and electrolytes because, as, as we mentioned, this is accompanied by fevers, chills, vomiting, and diarrhea. Okay, pregnant women are at risk of osteoporosis, so steroids should be used with caution. And remember, alendronic acid is contraindicated in pregnancy. Cyclosporin, on the other hand, is safe in pregnancy if your prednisolone fails to control the disease. So here are, here are our referral criteria to secondary care. In general, women should be referred, in obstetric con referred to an obstetric consultant if they have symptoms and signs of the following dermatosis. So you refer to an ob if you have pemphigoid gestation is, and intrahepatic stasis of pregnancy. Why only two? Because, as I've mentioned in the previous slides, only your femphigoid gestation is and your intrahepatic cholestasis have uh, an effect on fetal outcome. So the other two dermatoses, they doesn't have a fetal effect, okay? So it resolves spontaneously. So if you have these two conditions, you refer to obstetric consultant. Women who should be referred to a dermatologist include femphigoid gestation is, polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, and any skin eruption associated with systemic symptoms. Ideally, patients with any skin eruption should be seen in a joint obstetric and dermatology clinic. Okay, so now uh, let me go first, uh, give me five minutes, I will go to the chat box and see. Ah, okay, thank you very much everyone. Uh, there was no question you're very good to me there was no there was no question they are recommending that you watch the webinar of dr helmy thank you everyone so now let's go to our question we only have few questions okay Wait. question number one is intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy associated with postpartum hemorrhage you can write in the chat box if you're afraid to, to talk. I will look at it, okay? Okay, very good. So it's true, okay? Okay, when do you check LFTs postpartum? Answers, please.
Okay, very good. 10 days. I mentioned to you, you check your LFTs postpartum after 10 days because there is increased elevation of your LFTs immediately post-delivery. Okay, very good. All of you answered A. Okay, I'll wait. Huh? The chat box is covering my screen. There's a 35-year-old woman who is diagnosed with intrahepatic cholestasis pregnancy and is commenced on therapy with also the oxycholic acid or UDCA. Unfortunately, there is no change in the symptoms or biochemical profile. Which second-line drug should be considered? Chlorpheniramine, cholestyramine, dexamethasone, rifampicin, or your vitamin K? You give her UDCA, but there's no improvement in the pruritus and your liver function. Okay. So it's D, okay? Very good. So it's D, I mentioned to you, right? Rifampicin is not mentioned in your TOG article 2013, but it was mentioned in the 2016 article of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Okay, next question. What is the most common dermatosis of pregnancy? Most common? Type down your answers. Okay. Okay, very good. It's A, atopic eruption of pregnancy. Don't forget that, okay? Question number five, and I think this is our last question. A 35-year-old, 32 weeks age of gestation with rash, blisters, Involving the umbilicus, tri, uh, thigh, trunk, and abdomen. Which is what is your diagnosis? Okay, the answer is very good. The femfigoid gestation is okay. So um, before I end this um, lecture or presentation, let me call to you, call on to you, our uh, technical team to present to you. If you like this webinar, I would like to tell you that this is how we uh, give lectures for MRCOG1. Okay, we discuss the topic, we give you some questions to answer, we clarify your concepts, and then. We have a support group in the Facebook page, okay? We, create, we will create a Facebook page for you. So if you like this webinar, I hope that you will support our MRCOG1 course together with Dr. Muhammad Helmi and Dr. Ramya. As, again, as I've mentioned, I will be your mentor for statistics and bio, bio, microbiology. Okay, so let me give first to you our technical team to discuss to you how to register to, for the course, and then I will go over to your chat box. Thank you so much, Dr. Desri, for the lovely session. Hello, everyone. This is Mafia. Hope you all are doing well. Today, I'm here to guide you all about the new course that is for you people. First of all, let me tell you that MRCOG1 course is of three months, which is starting from 16th of March, 2021. Our main course will be Dr. Mohammed Helmi, Dr. Tazri, and Dr. Ramya. The main course features are there will be live sessions in which you can directly interact with your mentor. Then we have topic tests in which you can test your preparation after every week. Then we have mock exam which will be conducted after the three months course and we have session recordings. If any one of you have missed your session, then you can watch the recording of that session in your, in your website. And then we have a study group for your support. Now, this is the most important thing that how you can register for the course. First of all, what you have to do is you have to click on this sign up button as 
the given below in the picture. Then you have to click on this course catalog. Once you will click on this course catalog, you will select a course. Let's say I have selected MRCOG1 July 21 course. After that, you have to click on this, this course now. Once you will click this, then you will have your payment procedure. You have to follow that. And then the course will automatically uh, add it to your account. So if you have any other question, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Mafia. You're welcome. Uh, I will just like to answer three questions that I saw in the chat box before we totally end this session. Yes, please share. Okay. Um, doctor, who is this? Uh, I have a question here. It, uh, she's asking if rifampicin is safe in pregnancy, to be given in pregnancy. Um, the FDA category of your rifampicin is category C. You, uh, what we mean is when you have a category C, um, category C, FDA category in pregnancy, you have to weigh the benefits over the risk, okay? So yes, it is safely given in pregnancy, especially um, in patients with pulmonary tuberculosis in pregnancy, rifampicin is being given. And I have another question, is um, rifampicin can be given to brucellosis in pregnancy? Yes. Rifampicin can be given to brucellosis in pregnancy together with septriaxone. Okay, so if you don't have any more questions, I hope you answered your question. And I hope to see you in our regular course, which will start on March 16. Okay, thank you everyone and happy Friday. Bye bye.